we have that, that ability. We have the privilege of being able to do it, and we have the power to see that come to pass in our family's lives. So, you know, somebody prayed for us. Somewhere back somewhere, or we wouldn't be here today, I promise you that. We had some family member, a parent, a grandparent, an uncle, an aunt, somebody that knew the Lord and said, I want my family saved. I want to see them again in heaven. Praise God. What a beautiful, loving God we have. Thank the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Welcome, everybody. Appreciate you being here with us. Thank God you all are out and about. We get the opportunity to come together and fellowship a little bit, spend some time together as well as with the Lord. Praise God. And all of you on Facebook and the Internet and live streaming or whatever you're out there and however you're out there, we love you and appreciate you being a part of the service today and every day. Thank you for your continued support, and uh, we appreciate you all so much. Looking forward to the time when we can all be together again. In the meantime, we're together in spirit, and God is with all of us. Praise the Lord. So God bless you this morning. Appreciate you all. And uh, thank you, uh, Tim, as always, for opening and doing such a great job. And thank you for last week as well. Uh, he stepped in, and, and great message. I was able to uh, watch it uh, online, and did a great job. All of you did. Thank you, Suzanne and Michael, again, as always, and uh, appreciate so much what you guys are doing. Thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Beautiful songs this morning. They always are, but for some reason these were especially touching and appropriate, I guess. They certainly were fantastic. Praise the Lord. You know, I had a dream <coughs> that God sneezed, and I didn't know what to say to him. <laughs> Never mind. Praise the Lord. Amen. Okay, well, there's a lot of exercise people going on and about and trying to get you involved in their exercise programs. I've got a big yard and uh, a lot of grandkids, so I don't need a whole lot of exercising. In fact, uh, if exercise is so good for you, I'd like to know why athletes have to retire by the time they're 35. (laughs) I do like long walks, though, especially when they're taken by people who annoy me. (laughs) Jesus. But really, Americans are getting a lot stronger. You know, uh, 25 years ago, it took two people to carry $20 worth of groceries. Today, a five-year-old kid can do it. (laughs) All right, enough of my foolishness. Praise the Lord. God is good. And uh, again, I appreciate so much the the way we prepare to to come into the message. It sets everything up. It makes it so much easier for me, for sure. And uh, God is, it, it shows me how God is speaking to all of us, amen, the same by the Spirit, you know, and, and it just makes things come together, makes it much more uh, simple, I guess, and uh, simple is something I know a lot about, praise the Lord. So uh, I'd like to open with uh, a couple of scriptures here this morning, and I'm starting with uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans 15. Verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And then 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Praise God. So Paul is speaking to us about why the scriptures are and what they're really about. The Bible is way more than just a collection of unrelated stories, history, and experiences of others. But there's a master theme, and it runs throughout the entire scripture, and it tells one central story. And the central story is that God has taken the initiative to enter into a blood covenant with us through Jesus Christ. In the Hebrew scriptures, uh, God provided a written record of the 
pictures of the Messiah or he himself that would come. Amen. And so Jewish people would recognize him when he did show up. Right. So let's look at this in John uh, chapter one, verses 11 and 12. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So ironically, the Gentiles received and accepted him, but most of the Jews didn't. I mean, there were Jews, obviously, who did receive him, but the majority of the people that were being uh, received by Christ were Gentiles. And it's interesting that <clears throat> October 1st was the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles this year. And it'll go through, uh, it's a seven-day feast. And so we're right, actually, we're right in the midst of, the, of it right now. And it's, the Feast of Tabernacles is one of those pictures that God gives us. And it was something he gave to the Jews as a revelation of Jesus, the Messiah. Look at, let's look at Zechariah 14 and verse 16. So the feasts were for a purpose, and they were the, for, the purpose of the feast, the same purpose as the Bible, to reveal God to us in the person of Jesus Christ. So it, came, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Praise the Lord. Exodus 23 and verse 16. And I, while we're going there, uh, Exodus uh, 23 verse 16, the common belief uh, is that the rapture will take place at this particular time. Now, can't say the day or the hour. No man knows, the scripture says, but God gives us pictures. And this is the final feast of the religious season. And so uh, it's believed by many that this will be the season when Jesus returns. I'm not saying it's this time, this moment. I'm saying it will be at this time of the year, I believe, based on what the scriptures are showing us, that he will return. So... The feast of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. He's st still talking about the feast of tabernacles, okay? Because it was a harvest feast. It was a feast that takes place at the end of the harvest year, okay? Uh, Deuteronomy 16 and verse 16. Deuteronomy 16 and verse 16. Three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So the feast of tabernacles celebrated the final uh, harvest or the fat, final gathering of the harvest and, and that God had blessed the people with for that year. Amen? And so the people could rest from their harvest work. They were. It was a time when they were to do nothing but just enjoy the feast, right? And the Feast of Tabernacles was the last of seven feasts, and it completed the religious season. The number seven in the Bible, as Tim uh, mentioned earlier, is the number of completion, which is why many people believe that that will be when the return of the Lord takes place. So Paul says that these things were written for our learning. So we learn from this that the Feast of Tabernacles represents the completed or finished work of God both in this age that we're living in and also in the lives of the individual believers. Leviticus, let's look at this, Leviticus 23, uh, verse 33 through 36. Leviticus 23, verses 33 through 36. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, the fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. Now recognize, obviously, that their calendar is not the, the uh, Julian calendar. It's not the Gregorian calendar. It's none of those calendars. It's not even a lunar calendar. It is the calendar that God gave the, the Jewish people. In fact, this month uh, of what we call October would be Tishri. 
I believe it is, and that would, uh, in the Jewish calendar, that would be the end of September and the beginning of October. They, they overlap, where we have two separate months there. That it would have one month that would be overlapping there. So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You will do no servile work therein. Seven days ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no servile work therein. All right, look at verses 40 uh, through 43, still in Leviticus 23. Verses 40 through 43. Now, he, he repeats this, is what's happening, and we're, I'm just skipping the part where he repeats, and then he goes on to say, And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. <coughs> and you shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You will celebrate it in the seventh month. You will dwell in booths. Seven days, all that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Praise the Lord. So the Feast of Tabernacles had two aspects associated with it. First, it looked back to the 40 years that the Jews were wandering in the wilderness after they had been delivered from Egypt, right? They lived in shelters or tabernacles, right? So their wandering was the result of unbelief. Their wandering was because they didn't believe what God had promised them. Amen. But God was still, even though they didn't believe him, God was still in their midst providing for every need that they had. Yes. Praise the Lord. God's showing us something there that you, we, we think of the Old Testament God was this cruel, you know, vindictive. No, he, he was trying to do things even when they wouldn't cooperate. Yes. Amen. So eventually... He brought them into the land of rest that he had promised. And as a constant reminder, God commanded the Hebrews to build booths or shelters to live in during this feast. That was to remind them of that time. Yes. Right? But the Feast of Tabernacles also had a, a forward look. And the shelters they built were, boot, were, were loosely built. They were just kind of ramshackle things. And they were built that way so that they could look through the roof into the heaven so that they could see the majesty and the glory of God, you know, in a natural kind of setting. Amen. And that was to remind them that they were pilgrims, that they were just passing through this place. We all are just pilgrims. We're just here and we're gone, right? I mean, there's a brief period of time. And uh, that was to remind them of this pilgrimage that they were in in this life. And that God had an even greater rest for them. They were to rest in this life. But he had a greater rest for them in the future when he would come and live among us, amen, permanently. Praise the Lord. That was the hope of Abraham. Right? Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. Hebrews 11, 8 through 10. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went. But faith, by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Jesus is the ultimate tabernacle. The ultimate dwelling place for God. Amen? In a human form. God dwells in our midst through Jesus who gives us his spirit to dwell in us. Amen? And for us. Look at, I want to show you something in Matthew chapter 11, uh, verses 27 through 30. Remember Jesus was always saying, I and my Father are one. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He was trying to make something very obvious to the Jewish people. And that was God had come. God had visited them. God was here for them. They didn't recognize him because he wasn't like what they had preconceived in their mind. They, they were looking at these stories as though they were the facts. When the stories were just to point them to God. 
they, they turned it into a history book or into a, a rule book instead of a guide or a, a, a map to God or a, a, a picture of God, if you will. So all these things are delivered unto me of my Father, Jesus said. Now think about this and where it's going. He says, everything I have comes from the Father. Nobody knows the Son, meaning him, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal to him. So Jesus is saying, it's like saying I and my Father are one. Nobody knows him but me. And nobody knows me but him. I mean, really knows God. And then to them that I will reveal them to, which would be us when we get saved, when we have a revelation of God and so forth. And who he reveals to. Come unto me, then he says. After that, after he says, God, here's how God is. I'm going to show you God. I'm here to show you God. Now, these are Jews who have been working their way through this system for generation after generation after generation, thinking they understand God. When, in fact, they just understood rules and regulations. They really didn't understand God, or they would have recognized him when he showed up. And Jesus, is that's what he's trying to show them in this little... A uh, few paragraphs. All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Nobody knows the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father except the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Yes. So then come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He's talking about what the Father wants yes. to do. Right? Take my yoke. Take the yoke of God. Not the religious, not, the, not what the Pharisees are saying, not what the Sadducees are saying. Do what I'm saying. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me because I'm meek and lowly in heart and you will find rest unto your souls. How many people have come to God and found nothing but more work, more labor, more fear, more anxiety, more stress because they didn't know who they were trying to reach and who was trying to reach them. And Jesus is making it so plain. For my yoke is easy. He's talking about God now. It's not two different people we're talking about here. He said my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the God that we serve. That's the God that wants to invade this earth. That's the God he wants us to reveal. Amen. He gave us his spirit so that we could do what Jesus did, and that is to show God in human, in this realm. We find rest in God through him. God himself is our rest. When we know God, we can relax. Yes. It's what Tim has been talking about with the songs that we sang. When we really understand God, we can relax. We can take. He's got this. Yes. He can handle this. We yes. just have to keep our focus on Him yes. and not on all the junk. Amen. That's the message He's trying to get to us in this last day. Not only to us, but to this world. Yes. Because that's the message that will bring Him again. Jesus doesn't give us life. He is our life. Praise the Lord. He doesn't give us peace. He is our peace. Peace I give you. My peace I give unto you. He is our peace. He doesn't give us love. God is love. He is himself everything that we need. What we try to get from God is simply manifestations of God. It's just his own life that we're struggling after. He says what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What's his righteousness? Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God, and we become righteous because of that. So it's saying, seek Jesus, and you'll find God. You'll find the kingdom. You'll understand the kingdom, and you'll get it all. Praise the Lord. Jesus himself is our rest. Come unto me, and I'll give you rest. There were two Jewish rituals that were associated with the Feast of Tabernacles, and they dramatically illustrate the difference between the ritual that pointed to Jesus and the reality of Jesus the person. Jews always seemed to find the rituals that pointed, but never found what it was pointing to. The first ritual of pouring of water and it took place on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And the, the priest, uh, in Hebrew it's called the uh, Hashanah Rabbah, which means the day of 
the great Hosanna. That Hebrew phrase, Hosanna, translates in English as save now or deliver us. So this took place on the last day of the feast that we're celebrating or that we're talking about here this morning. And that's when the Jews would they'd pray for rain. So they would have a crop, a harvest the following year, right? And so uh, they'd pray for rain, and then they would pray for God's salvation through the coming Messiah. Amen? And the ritual of water had both a physical and a spiritual significance. Physically, it made a special thanksgiving offering to God for the rain that he would send. That was the physical act of it. That's what they understood. So they would offer an offering to God in faith, believing that then he would bring rain and give them a good crop throughout the following year. And spiritually, it pointed to coming of the Messiah, who would give them living waters for the Spirit of God. So the priest would go and draw water from the pool of Siloam. Remember, that's where Jesus, there was a healing that Jesus uh, performed there too. The guy said, I can't ever get in the water. You know, every time I need somebody, uh, nobody will help me, and I'm crippled, and I can't do it. And Jesus healed him without ever going in the water. He was the water that that pool was representing. He was the truth of what that was about. Amen. And so the priest would draw water from that pool of Siloam, and they would take it in a gold pitcher, and they would take it to the temple and pour it in a basin at the foot of the altar. Mm -hmm. At the same time, other uh, priests would blow their trumpets, and all the people would wave palm branches and these wow. different tree branches that we looked at here a moment ago, right? Isaiah 12 and verse 3. We're living in a time, man, I mean, that the Bible has been pointing us to yes. for thousands of years. Yes. Therefore, we shall, with joy, shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. Yeah. See, it's amazing. They had these scriptures, but they didn't have any way, any clue of, of connecting them. Yeah. They were just intellectual rules and rituals, right? Look at Isaiah 44 and verse 3. For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. Just like the song we just sang. But look at this then in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. This was the rituals that they were doing. This is what they had read. But look at what Jesus says when he shows up in the person. In the last days, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. The last day of the feast was the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Believe me, he was rocking some boats. Yeah. When he started talking this way, the priests and most, and many of the people, they understood the connections he was making, and they didn't like it, because they believed, they knew, this is just about, let's do this work, let's do the thing, and we'll go and it, we'll offer up our sacrifice, not recognizing that the very God who had given them this was standing right before them. Jesus was saying, look to me and be saved now. Yes. Right? I am the great Hosanna, is what he was saying. Yes. I am your salvation. I'll give you water of the Spirit if you receive me as the true tabernacle of God, or the true dwelling place of God. The other ritual was the uh, lighting the temple. And so thousands of people who would come to Jerusalem for this feast... And there were thousands of them. They'd come from all over to come to Jerusalem for these special feast times. And so they, they would come to keep this feast, and they would crowd it into the temple area, amen, and they would carry torches. And the entire city, I mean, you could see this light for miles around Jerusalem. I mean, you've got to figure 10, 15, 20,000, maybe more, maybe uh, 30, 40,000 people with torches. It could be seen for miles. Amen? And so that also had a physical and a spiritual significance. So the sunshine was needed to have a successful harvest, right? 
So you had to have light, you had to have the sunlight, so that those torches on one, one level represented sunlight. And so they need to have sun in order to have a successful harvest. And they thank God for the sun necessary for a good harvest, right? And they also recognized that God was light. In Psalms 27, verse 1, he is the light, right? If you want to pull it up there just so we can see it, but... The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is my light. So this light represented that. Amen. And it was during that time that Jesus made another bold statement in John chapter 8 and verse 12. I am the light. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life. He's saying, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you'll find eternal life. And they are the things that are talking about me. At both of these festival events, Jesus declared in a clear, a powerful, dramatic way that he was the reality of what the feasts pointed to. He was everything that they were looking for. So uh, let's go to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Well, we know they, they had these booths, these tabernacles that they built to remind them of their unbelief, to remind them of their disobedience to God, their inability to get into the promised land or the land of rest on their own. So wherefore, here... It says, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. <sighs> Praise the Lord. God wanted to lead them into the promised land of rest. But they died in the wilderness because of their unbelief. Hebrews 3, uh, verses 16 through 19. I'm telling you, what I'm believing is that we, we have to enter into rest before we're going to experience everything that God has for us. These are the days. These are the days where this has to come to pass. I believe it's why in the last five, ten years, whatever it is, we've heard more and more about grace, the message of grace. We never heard much of that before, not when I was growing up or not when, even when I was first saved. It was, more, it was all about works. It was all about the old covenant, basically. So for some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? So he said, not, not everybody, some people, but not all of them, did provoke God or refuse to believe. But some of them did when they came out of Egypt. But the ones he was grieved with for 40 years wasn't that those that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. Or in other words, wasn't it the ones who didn't believe? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not. That's who he was talking to when he told them, you're not going to enter in. He wasn't keeping them out. He was saying, you can't, there's only one way to enter in, and that's by faith. Amen. You've got to believe what I've said. So we see they could not enter in because of unbelief. Mm -hmm. Now, let this, think about this. The Jews who died in the wilderness, they were saved. Because they were offering the sacrifices that were demanded. They were, even though they didn't understand in their heart, they were doing what they were told to do in that respect. So they were saved, but they never got the benefit of their salvation because they never entered the promised land. They never got the rest. Right? So that's the, that's the picture he's trying to show us today. There's a rest for you. And it doesn't just come when you die and go to heaven. There is a rest for you here and now. And that's what I want you to experience. I want you to experience it so that you can share that with others. Amen. God's rest isn't dying and going to heaven. God's rest is peace yes. here and now in the midst of all the chaos, in the midst of all the confusion, in the midst of all the fear and anxiety and stress that the whole world's going through and we're going, wait, we can take the land. Yes. 
We're well able. God has told us we can do this. We can handle this. And that's what the world needs to see. Not more rules, not more demands from God, but God's just saying, come and take it. This is yours. I want you to come and drink from the wells of salvation. And out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. See, it's living in the fullness of God's life here and now. Experiencing what Jesus experienced. It's walking in His peace. It's walking in His power. It's walking in His rest. In the Bible, and those of you coming out of Holiness Pentecostal know this because this was preached all the time. Everything was sin. Leprosy was a type of sin. And I understand the symbolism of it, and, and it's true, it was, but it was symbolic, right? Well, in the scripture, Egypt symbolizes the world system, right? Power, authority, strong survive. You know, the, the, the bigger is better, and all the, you know, those that have get more, and those that have not get less. They get nothing, right? So the promised land represents God's rest. If Egypt represents the world system, then the promised land represents the rest of God, right? Yes. Yes. And the wilderness is what lies in between. Yeah. Now, when a person accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior, the Lamb of God, right? That's you put a lamb, the blood on the doorpost, eat it, so forth and so forth. So when that he's showing them what, he's, what we know to be a fact today, right? That Jesus is the Lamb of God. So God delivers them out of a type of spiritual Egypt. When we get born again, that's what takes place. We get delivered from spiritual Egypt, from the world system, from the, from the way everything works in the world, which is dog eat dog, you know, kill, do unto others before they get a chance to do it to you and all that kind of stuff. Believers came out of spiritual Egypt the moment they received Jesus. They got the sacrifice was made. Right? And then they get the benefit of that sacrifice, which means you get out of Egypt. You're no longer uh, identified with that world system as far as God's concerned. Now you're his. Amen? Like the Hebrews, believers won't enjoy God's rest, amen, in their lives unless they walk by faith, unless they walk in faith and trust in what God has said. They'll go to heaven. They're just not going to get any benefit of being born again in this life. They'll have a little peace maybe about knowing, what, well, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. But they, nothing changes normal because you're still operating under the conditions and under the rules and under the system of this world instead of operating by his rules. His rules are, you believe me. You trust me. You walk by faith. The just shall live by faith. You rest in me. Right? All believers are going to experience God's final rest in heaven. But sadly, a lot of them are going to miss what they have present available to them. Yes. The rest that is here and now. Praise the Lord. We all need to become tabernacle Christians. Yes. We all need to be aware that this is just a pilgrimage. Yes. But while we're here, we have influence. While we're here, we are the dwelling place of God. We are the tabernacle of God. Isaiah 51, verses 10 and 11. I hope I'm making some sense. It made sense to me while I was... <laughs> I mean, I just think... Because if he's pointing... If he was pointing them to something, he's pointing us to something. And I think we, it's easy for us to get caught up in the religion too, even, even if it's... Uh, a, the different religion is even though we're not uh, doing the same things, we can still turn our faith in God into some religious activity and miss the promises and the blessings of God. Lose track of the fact that God has found a dwelling place in us. This is the rest wherewith the weary shall find rest. This is the place where labor is no longer needed between uh, me and God. I rest in his promise that everything he has promised me is mine. I just have to believe it. I just have to walk by faith to receive it. Healing, deliverance, prosperity, whatever it might be, it all comes through the same avenue of faith in God. Faith in the finished work 
That seventh day work that was done, it's all finished now. So art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? He's talking about Egypt and how God split the sea so they could go through. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing into Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Yes. He's talking to us, church. He wasn't, he, these things were all written for us, Paul yes. said. They didn't understand it. Hopefully we will, so that we can get the benefit of what it is God has made available to us. Amen? Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 16. Praise God. Zechariah 14 and 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. This isn't a Jewish feast. It's a Jesus feast. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's a feast of the Lord. We just cast it off say, well, that's the Jewish thing. We're here in the New Testament and it doesn't mean anything. Yeah, it, does. it means everything because he's trying to tell us we are the New Jerusalem. A Hebrew is not a Hebrew because he had a Hebrew mama and daddy. He said a Hebrew is a Hebrew if he has the faith of Abraham. Yes. Amen. We have been grafted into the Hebrews, into the Jewish people. Yes. Amen. By faith. That's how it works. Yeah. I'm not against Jewish people. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just saying we can get all wrapped up in the, in the arguing about it. And the truth is, we're as Jewish as we're ever going to get. We're as Jewish as Jesus. How can we not be if we're his offspring? Matthew 5, 17 and 18. And I, I'll show you what Jesus was trying to explain to his his people in the sense of, of his uh, ethnicity. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Just leave this up here for a second, if you will, Suzanne. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So he says, I didn't come to destroy, I came to fulfill. And it's interesting, when you look up the translation for those words, the word fulfilled literally translates true or correct interpretation of Scripture. Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the Scripture. I came to give you a true and accurate description yes. of the Scripture or a, a translation yeah. that you would understand that it was written the way I intended it to be written. I want you to understand it the way I wrote it, the way I meant it to be understood. Yes. So he said, this thing, none of this is going away until you get a true, correct interpretation of the Scripture. Woo! I mean, that excites me because we're, we, we've got some interpretation this today in the last 30 years or whatever that, that, that hardly anybody's understood. Why? For the very reason Tim said earlier, because we were born for such a time as this. That's why we're able to have the interpretation because we're here at the time when it needs to be revealed. Because Jesus is on the verge of coming again. But he's not coming this time for a people who don't know him. He's coming for the people who are his own. Praise God. Amen. And destroy. He says, I didn't come to destroy this. I came. I, and, and that word destroy meant to give a false or incorrect interpretation. So he said, I didn't come to give you some phony interpretation here. I came to give you the true and accurate interpretation of the scripture. I didn't come to pretend to be something. I came to reveal to you the truth of God. I came to reveal to you who God really is and what God's purpose and, and desire is for every human being. Praise God. Hallelujah. The scripture, he, he said, when I fulfill this, it doesn't exist anymore as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Or for anybody who believes me. Mm -hmm. I am the fulfillment yes. of everything in this Bible. And when you receive me, you fulfilled it too. You have fulfilled or you have taken and understood the exact correct interpretation of what God was trying to show us. Amen. Woo! I, I mean, I, that, that blows my mind. Because we're not smart enough to figure this stuff out on our own. It has to be by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to pour out... 
my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will have visions. Amen. And that's where we're living today. Because we can give a correct interpretation of a vision. We can give a, a correct interpretation of a dream. Why? Because we have the right foundation. The feasts are, are God's pictures pointing to Jesus. Jesus is God's ultimate visual aid. Yes. He is the ultimate picture or identity or truth of God and his nature. Look, look at this, Romans 10, 4 again. Let's look at that where we started here. I'm about to close. Jesus, this is crazy. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. That word in translates literally goal. G-O-A-L. For Christ is the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. He's the goal that the law was put there for. To get us to Jesus, not to get us to more laws, not to get us to a different law or a separate law or an under kind of law. It's the law was to point us or to get us to the goal. The goal was come to Jesus. Know your God. Yes. Know that he loves you. Yes. Receive what he has for you. Jesus is the goal. It's not more religion. It's not more rules. It's not more regulations. It's get them to Jesus for crying out loud because he's the only one that can change anything. That's right. Focusing on the pictures is religion. Focusing on the person is relationship. And that's what God has always been about. Not more religion. Get them to Jesus. Get them to me. Here's, here's your path to me. But you have to look at it through spiritual eyes. You can't read it like it's a rule book or like you get this preconceived idea that God hates everybody and is trying to hurt everybody. And then how are you going to find him in there? You won't. You will not find that God. You'll find religion, but you won't find God because that God doesn't exist. Yes. Psalm 62 and 11 says that power belongs to God. Amen. God has made his power available to us through Jesus Christ. What do you say? Not by might, not by power, not by my might, not by my power, but by your spirit, saith the Lord. Or by my spirit, saith the Lord. Peace. My peace I give unto you. Not peace like the world gives that you, you know, it comes and goes like the roller coaster that Don's talking about. And we all know it. We all live in it. Right? That's not the peace I'm giving you. Peace I give you passes understanding. It doesn't make sense in the world you're living in, but you'll still have it even when nobody else does. Yes. Thank you, Lord. We need God's power. No question about it. We need God's peace, especially in the times that we're living in. We also need God's rest. Amen. Most especially in these days, in the last days. We've got to walk in divine peace, divine power, and divine rest. So as Jesus is, so are we in this present world. Because that's what this world needs. We, we, we look to the government. We look to a man or a woman or a group or a political side or this or that. Look, folks. I get it. We have a civic responsibility as citizens. We, we yeah. should vote. We should vote our conscience and our hearts. That's good. That's what we do. But my confidence is not yes. in who's in that White House. My confidence is the God who holds it all in his hand. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm voting Jesus. Amen. I'm voting God every day, 365 days a year. And I'm going to walk in the rest of knowing that he's going to meet all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And that means all of my needs, whether it's fear, whether it's peace, whether it's joy, whether it's fulfillment of all things I desire. He said, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. We are all children of Abraham because we live by faith. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Every day is a feast. We say every meal is a feast and every day is a holiday. Well, in Jesus, that's exactly right. Praise the Lord. Give him a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise
praise God. Thank you, Lord. I just say, pass the water. Hallelujah. Pass the water. Glory to God. We're going to have an outpouring. We're going to see a harvest that no one has seen. We're going to understand why we have this celebration of a harvest this time of the year. Because there's going to be floods of souls being born again before that great coming of the Lord. Amen. The greatest harvest that the world has ever known is going to take place before Jesus returns. And we get to be a part of it. Amen. Give him one more hand this morning. Praise God. Glory to God. Amen, amen. We, we, we are so privileged to have been born in the time we've been born in. And the devil knows it and he hates it and he's throwing everything at us he can. But it ain't enough. There ain't enough COVID-19. There ain't enough any fear or anxiety or anything else that can stop a move of God when God's in it. Amen. And that's what we're dealing with today. Praise God. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate your patience. Have a great day. Enjoy the feast. Amen. Yes. You're dismissed Amen. in Jesus' name. <laughs>